Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And in today's video, I'm going to uh, deviate from my series to discuss the origins of Cauchy's unrigorous calculus. Now, many years ago, uh, a certain professor called Judith Grabener wrote a book called The Origin of Cauchy's Rigorous Calculus. I'll be discussing that in this video. Let's begin. Now, uh, this, the way it works is something like this. Um, Cauchy had given this definition using infinity, okay? And by the way, he began with the definition of continuity, which was uh, just adjusted slightly to exclude the point that was being discussed. And there's a good reason for that, because uh, later on, this very same definition uh, would be used to define the derivative. Okay, so in its current form, it includes the point which at which uh, continuity is being discussed. So uh, what it says is, let f of x be a function of a variable x, and let's suppose that for every value of x between two given limits, this function always has a unique and finite value. Well, I don't know how any value cannot be finite. <laughs> that seems to be like an oxymoron to me. If beginning from one value of x lying between these limits, we assign to the variable x an infinitely small increment. Now, I want you to notice that Cauchy, or Cauchy said infinitely small increment increment okay h the function itself increases by the difference which is that and this depends simultaneously on the new variable h and on the value of x given this the function f of x will be a continuous function of this variable within the two limits assigned to the variable x if for every value of x between these limits the absolute value of the difference decreases indefinitely indefinitely without of h. In other words, the function f of x will remain continuous with respect to x between the given limits if between these limits an infinitely small increment of the variable always produces an infinitely small increment of the function itself. So as you can see, this is the exact definition which Weierstrass took and translated into this. He said that given any distance uh, less than epsilon, then if this distance is less than delta, this implies uh, that such a distance will always be less than epsilon, where L is the limit at the point C. Now remember, this is already very circular because you need to know the limit. And in most cases, in fact, in every case, you don't know the limit unless you find it using the flawed first principles method. Okay. And then, of course, the modus operandi is to verify it using this uh, so-called logic, but even this fails because this here is based on infinity and infinitesimals. And I'm about to show you how. So you can read my book. This is uh, one of the chapters in my book, which is called The Lack of Rigor in Mainstream Mathematics. <clears throat> it's very detailed. So now <clears throat> in this example, where we take the function 2x plus 1, um, it, it works something like this. You first try to uh, change this distance into the format of f of x minus the limit. So once you get it to that format, then you can find delta in terms of epsilon. So in this case here, yeah, any epsilon over 2 for delta will do. And now your professor will play the epsilon delta game with you. It goes something like this. Give me any epsilon and I will find you a delta that works for it. So if you pick, let's say, for example, epsilon is equal to 1, then it's true that the absolute value of x minus 2 less than a half implies that the function is less than 1, okay, at the point x equals 2, right, which is what we wish to prove. So the astute reader will notice that this process not only assumes the function is defined and hence continuous on this interval 1, 3, but that the alleged proof, it's actually a fake proof, uses the concept of infinity to show that one can get closer to the limit indefinitely, but never actually arrive at the limit. Therefore, the ill-formed concept of infinity is still being used contrary to the raucous objections of those in the mainstream academia. 
These facts are the main reason why Weierstrass needed epsilon and delta greater than zero. Firstly, because we can't make epsilon as small as we please. If we want it to be zero, we can't do that. That is, it can't be zero. Secondly, the function may not be defined at the limit when x is equal to c. And thirdly, the function may not be defined at some x equal to k in the given interval m less than k less than n. That is, if we multiplied our, fun our function by 1, this is the way mainstream academic morons introduce holes into the function and undefine it at x is equal to k. Then it is true that f of x is no longer defined at k, and c could be anywhere in the interval. Thus, we can say that given any epsilon, that delta will be within x minus c distance of c, simply because it's not possible to check every distance in the interval m, comma, n. So, that this is true is a consequence of the fact that the function f is, is continuous on 1, 3, and continuity must be assumed, okay? There's no way you can prove it. There is no certainty that f is continuous, because you can punch a hole anywhere in that interval by multiplying by 1, okay? and picking any k you like in the interval and therefore despite all the efforts despite all the efforts of mainstream academic to discard infinity and infinitesimals both concepts are needed and used indirectly uh, in showing uh, that epsilon is within f of x minus l distance of l that if it is then delta will be within x minus c distance of c okay so now I'm, go I'm going to show you very quickly in an applet that uh, if we, for example, have this same function that I showed you, this is what is meant, that you can get closer and closer to the point without actually getting to the point, right? When you get to the point, it's not defined there. And as you can see here, I've defined most of these points, but now I'm going to undefine this point here, 1.6, okay? Watch me do that. I'm going to undefine 1.6 very quickly. So all I have to do is just grab this here, which is, oh, let me just multiply it. Uh, or I'll do it right here. So all I have to do is just say this and say x minus 1.6 and x minus 1.6, right? Oh, I don't know what I did there, but that wasn't what I wanted to do. So let me undo that. And... Come on. That's strange. All right, something has gone horribly wrong here. All right, we're back there again. Let's try that one more time. So what I wanted to do was undefine this. And the way to do it is as follows. I'm sorry, I think I forgot to put the vinculum in. X minus 1.6 and X minus 1.6. That should work. Okay, so now that means that if we move this blue point to 1.6, it should no longer be defined, right? Let's see. Oh, didn't seem to have done that. Well, oh, I think I know why. It's probably because I haven't positioned this here. Okay, let's try again. So 1.6, there you are. So it's gone, right? So anytime we want to move this to 1.6, it's no longer there, right? And we can put it back in, obviously, by simply removing that multiplication by one. See how ridiculous the morons are in mainstream academia? So if I remove that, like so, and close that, then, and I do this, now see it's always there, right? It's there, it's back there again. And I've also removed 2.4 up here. See, 2.4 is not there. I can put 2.4 back in the same way by simply removing this part of the function here, right? So I can punch as many holes as I like in it. Uh, and that's what mainstream academic morons do. Uh, and so, and I can come back here again, and now it will be defined, as you can see, okay? So what I wanted to show you there is that infinity is still being used, despite all their efforts and infinitesimals. They've actually rigorized nothing. And... The book that Grabner wrote was called The Origins of Cauchy's Rigorous Calculus, but it should be called The Origins of Cauchy's Unrigorous Calculus. Her name was Judith Grabner, and she's a complete idiot who doesn't know anything about mathematics. But this book it has sold, I'm sure, many, many copies and has made her 
a substantial small fortune. And uh, here I am publishing the truth and telling you that these things are wrong. And I have discovered the only rigorous formulation of calculus in human history. But despite that, none of the evil reptiles in mainstream academia have the decency to come forward. Well, very few have. But uh, the, the people who actually run the academic trash heap at the main universities still refuse to acknowledge that I am the greatest mathematician. And I was the first to solve the tangent line problem. Uh, neither Newton, nor Leibniz, nor Cauchy, nor any other idiot who came before me and after Euclid was able to solve the problem. And not only that, I have also simplified integration. And if you read my new book, my new ebook, Calculus ebook, which is called An Introduction to the Single Variable New Calculus, it's free, and I'll place a link to the free download. You will learn more about calculus and mathematics than you have learned in all your university and school years. So I'm terribly out of breath now. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, small uh, presentation, which is a deviation from my series. And the reason I'm rushing is that I'm using a special screensaver, which only allows me 15 minutes. And since this is free and I don't have the money to purchase one, which I can go indefinitely, I'm sorry, but that's what you have to accept for the time being. Now, you can also contribute to my efforts by going to my main new calculus site and donating if you wish. And that would uh, help me to continue producing more videos and updating my book and producing more books because I have so many things I want to say, but there's certainly no way that I'm going to be able to say everything. Very well, I'm John Gabriel. This is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.